You know, every time I watch this film, and believe it, David and I have watched this film, and Susan and a lot of us, a few times, uh, <laughs> I am struck by the sense of shared purpose in World War II. And just, I mean, from the footage, from the interviews, I should mention we did 14 interviews for this film. We uploaded all of those interviews to the Library of Congress. And what we, they're kind of what I would call like legacy interviews. Like, poor Jim, how long did we interview you for? Like, I think it was about uh, two and a half, three hours. Three hours. <laughs> and all of it actually just excellent and something we really wanted to preserve. So we uploaded it to the um, uh, Veterans History Project, and they have the entire interview online for everyone to see, for future generations to see. And... 14 interviews, and I have to just say, it was really an honor to, to listen to all of their stories. It was really a gift of this show. So um, I guess, Jim, maybe tell us a little bit uh, about how you're a San Francisco native, and, and uh, you know, you hear a little bit of stuff about, you, you know, some bombing. I'm not of, really a San Francisco native. Well, you were in San Francisco at the I time. Yeah. I was living in San Francisco at the time. Yeah. But I was uh, registered for the draft up at uh, Placerville, and I went into the Army from Placerville. Uh, but I was working, uh, going to college and working at uh, uh, a gas station on, at uh, 17th and South Van Ness here in uh, San Francisco at the time. It was an uh, independent station. It was actually a Hancock Oil station. I don't know whether there's a station there or not. No, but I haven't been back for uh, probably 30 years or so. so. It's not far away. We could just walk oh, up there. right. <laughs> down, just down the street a yeah. little bit. And uh, actually, when the war started, uh, when I got to the station that morning, uh, it was a Sunday morning, and, and uh, when I got to the station, the kid who had opened the station uh, was already there and he said have you heard the news and i said no and he said the japs have bombed pearl harbor uh, and that was the first i knew of it and uh, uh, then there was uh, a lot of activity in the city uh, uh, later that afternoon and, and early evening and some of the streetcars weren't even running and uh, uh, we walked uh, from 17th and Van Ness up to Market Street. I don't know where he lived. I lived out on Fell Street at 1840 Fell Street and uh, walked all the way home. Uh, and I'm not sure how long it took me, but, uh, uh, but there were people out at the beach uh, uh, shouting about... Uh, that we were going to be invaded, and also there were uh, uh, people downtown uh, around the armory uh, trying to sign up or one thing or another. But uh, I didn't uh, enlist. I eventually was drafted, and uh, I had checked with, in with my draft board when I went home for the summer, and they said that uh, I wouldn't be drafted until I was 20 years old. I would be so I would be 20 years old in March of 1943. And uh, as soon as March of 1943 came around, uh, uh, I got a letter from the president, too. And, uh, that letter from the president we've heard so much about. <laughs> right. Uh, and I went, uh, uh, went down to Sacramento, and I passed the physical and uh, got on a, a bus and... Uh, uh, eventually wound up at the Presidio of uh, San Francisco, uh, uh, Presidio of Monterey, and uh, uh, which was the uh, reception center, and got all my clothing and uniforms, and one thing or another. And uh, then, after about a week there, uh, was transferred by train down to, uh, along with uh, uh, several others. Uh, none from my hometown, uh, down to a uh, uh, training camp 
between halfway between uh, uh, Houston and uh, Galveston. It was a temporary camp called uh, Camp Wallace, and it was an anti-aircraft uh, training camp, and we trained on uh, 90 millimeter uh, uh, weapons and uh, uh, 40 millimeter weapons. And then while I was there, uh, I had a number of tests and one thing or another, and, and uh, uh, I think uh, I had an interview and they told me that I was eligible to go to uh, um, Officers Candidate School or that I could uh, uh, return to college under the Army Specialized Training Program. And I elected to uh, continue my education, and so I uh, decided to, I, I took the Army Specialized Training Program, was transferred up to Camp Wallace, or not Camp Wallace, Camp, Camp Maxey uh, at Paris, Texas, which was in the very northeast corner of Texas, just about uh, three miles from the Oklahoma border. And... Uh, we had tests and one thing or another there, and after uh, 10 days or two weeks, um, I was transferred to uh, Pasadena Junior College at uh, Pasadena, and that was, I got there in either, must have been early September, I think, and um, then that program was being phased out and I went before a board and they asked me, uh, and I, I wasn't really cutting it because it was uh, uh, something I wasn't really interested in after I got into it because when I got to Camp Maxi, uh, I had uh, wanted to go into the psychology end of it and uh, they told me that the program wasn't available in psychology. The only, only thing that was available was uh, engineering and I had our medicine and, uh, and dentistry and I didn't uh, care for those but <laughs> I wanted to get back uh, uh, somewhere other than Texas I think so I said I'll take the engineering and that's where I wound up and I wasn't cutting engineering there one nice thing about being at uh, it wasn't the Pasadena main uh, campus of the Pasadena Junior College. It was, uh, had actually been uh, the John Muir High School, and it was uh, referred to as the East Campus, I believe it was, of Pasadena Junior College. And there were just soldiers there, just GIs like myself, and they had converted uh, uh, classrooms into uh, uh, barracks and one thing or another, and, and we were jammed, we had bunks, you didn't have, um, uh, there were about 20 or 30 people, I think, in a, a in bunk beds, uh, double bunks in, in uh, a classroom. And uh, it was an accelerated course, and I was having a great time down in Hollywood, though. <laughs> and uh, the result was that I wasn't... Uh, making what the grades that they thought I should be making. And I went before the board and they asked me what I wanted to do. And I said, well, I had a radio operator spec number, uh, which I had been, uh, I had excelled in, in uh, the Morse code at basic training. And uh, I'd like to go to back to the Signal Corps. And the major in charge of it said, well, uh, we can't send you back uh, we can't send you to the Signal Corps. Uh, we'll recommend you'll have to go back to the anti-aircraft training and, and uh, you'll go out here to Camp Hahn out by Riverside and, and um, that uh, we'll recommend that you be transferred to the, the Signal Corps. And I hung around the campus for about uh, three weeks, I think, before my orders came in and my orders and some other orders came in at the other time, at the same time, and I discovered I was transferred to the 104th Infantry Division 
on maneuvers at Camp Granite in the California Desert Training Center. Yeah. So, uh, that's so from the I desert to the desert. That, that was, <laughs> yeah. I became a desert rat, so to speak. But they were just finishing up maneuvers uh, when I arrived, and, along with some others. And uh, uh, a buddy of mine, and not from, from uh, Pasadena, he was actually transferred there from, from um, uh, University of Chicago. And he, uh, was, uh, he wound up in the 104th Infantry Division too. And he's still alive at, at, uh, uh, in Miami, Oklahoma. He, that's where he had come from. And uh, uh, I still converse with uh, Tom every once in a while, but uh, and we hit it off. But we were only there for a, a week or 10 days at the most, and then we were transferred to uh, we got there right at the end of the Desert Training Center, I think, because I noticed the film says that it uh, closed in, in the early spring of 44. We got there at the end of February. The division had just finished uh, uh, maneuvers with uh, another division. I don't know what the other division was. And we spent uh, uh, the next week or so just policing the desert and cleaning up uh, where they had been, and, and uh, then we were transferred to, to Camp Carson in Colorado, Colorado Springs. Matt, maybe you could talk a little bit about that. I mean, it's interesting, this desert, a million soldiers go through there, and yet not a lot remains, right? It's hard to see. I mean... Yeah, imagine a million men out in the desert over a broad area, but a lot of men and a lot of equipment, two years, and it was all designed to be temporary. You know, it wasn't supposed to last. It wasn't supposed to be your regular um, established camp. So it was all temporary. But what amazes me is how much is still out there. You still see these rock alignments. As you saw in the film, there's, there's traces of the training that went on out there still there. And you can still kind of get a sense of the, the size and the scope and the breadth of the training facility. It's really amazing. What's the status right now of the desert? I know that they're trying to get... Uh, you know, some protection and stuff. What, what, you know, what's the status right now? Well, it's such a huge facility. You know, it spans three states. So it depends upon um, what area you're looking at. But um, we're trying to get the, the entire facility listed on the National Register for Historic Places. Now, that doesn't mean the whole entire desert will be listed, but it'll be uh, a, a larger encompassing document that will recognize the significance of what went on out there. And then individual places will be, you know, um, contributing elements to that National Register District. I will say that when we're out in the desert with you, you know, there's like a little rock, a tiny rock alignment. You can say, oh, that was a mortar. That was a place where they put their submachine guns. And really, there's a need to kind of translate a little bit of what we're seeing, you know. And David was like a, amazingly expert at that. He really picked up on that. Talk a little bit about that, David. I mean, and not only that, all the great aerials that, that you and Beto got. I mean, it was pretty amazing. Well, you know, the first thing I want to say is um, what a great opportunity it was to work with Matt. He was our on-camera historian, but actually he was a collaborator yeah. in, the, uh, in the program because he wrote the he wrote the monographs on the De Desert Training Center. He did the original uh, studies. He crawled in and out and all over um, the, the terrain out there and discovered artifacts and sites and locations and created the historic narrative from which we drew in order to craft you know, a 30-minute story. And he's got a document that's, I don't know, 200 pages thick. Plus, I just found out today that Matt found the all that historic archival footage of the DTC. Uh, very few people, I would think, have seen that. It's not something that is particularly um, uh, well known, and maybe not even of interest to a lot of you know history buffs who are like you know hooked on the the action part of the uh, the topic of World War II. But Matt found it in the National Archives and convinced the Bureau of Land Management to uh, get that material in its highest uh, quality format. And it's what Kevin and I relied upon so heavily in order to tell the 
story in a very, you know, realistically documentary way. So I really can't you know, thank Matt enough for um, putting together the the uh, the um, raw material from which we drew uh, so much of of the film. And then, of course, being able to run around with, with Matt on location and begin to de de develop an eye for, you know, a, a depression in the ground that could have been in an explosive charge or a foxhole or something or rocks that were aligned in a certain way that, um, you know, according to his trained eye was a defensive formation. It all began to make sense once, you know, we were all out there and we began to see what soldiers would see um, as opposing units, large opposing, opposing units in, in many cases, would approach these defensive positions. I mean, they're war games, right? And But they were played in deadly earnest. Um, and so you would get Patton sitting up on what they call Patton's throne, watching these war maneuvers and with his uh, supporting... Uh, officers making notes and evaluating uh, the performance of these units. And I think, you know, what's so interesting is that the United States was new to this form of, of warfare, what we call Blitzkrieg. Um, these mobile units, tanks and artillery and uh, airplanes, all working in a coordinated way. You know, correct me if I'm wrong, Matt, but I think that this was the first place and the first time on such a large scale the United States um, uh, practiced in this kind of way in order to confront uh, a military, the German military, that had been practicing uh, this since uh, the Spanish Civil War uh, in the mid-30s. Yeah, that's right. They yeah, they had had maneuvers in Carolinas and the Carolinas and Louisiana, but there was nothing like the desert to really promote that realism. There was nothing in the way. Nothing had to be simulated. They could do warfare with everything except killing each other. They used live ammunition. They did not have to simulate the, the difficulty in moving over terrain and communicating with each other and running out of water, you know, fatigue of the men. None of that stuff had to be simulated. So it was really unprecedented training center. The, the real deal. And I'll just add one more thing. Um, it was dangerous out there. Yeah. Uh, Jim may have only spent 10 days uh, doing what, what he did, but typically the, the units would spend, what, three-month rotations out there. Actually, yeah. And they would get a full dose of what that desert and what that training had to offer. And it was not pleasant. The conditions were one thing. It was brutal. Uh, it could be equally cold as hot. Um, and Patton, as we tried to make clear in the film, set these incredibly rigorous standards. He did, he, his feeling was that the closer they simulated the actual horrible conditions of combat, the better chance people like Jim would have in returning home alive. And so guys would go out with one pint of water, you know, and do 15, 20 mile uh, marches. Um, they would engage, you know, in real active, you know, dog, dog fight uh, maneuvers, you know, in, in planes. Um, people died out there. People got injured. Um, it was just the way Patton set this up. Um, and in fact, it was sort of Patton's baby uh, out there that set the standard for rigor and, uh, I don't know, difficulty. Yeah. You know, he definitely knew that they were going to lose men. He had a famous quote. I can't quote it exactly, but he knew they were going to lose men to the training. But he said it was going to be worth it once they got into combat. And I think that really proved itself true with the units who spent the full three-month rotation there. You look at the combat records of those units and they did very well when they, you know, did run into well-trained and disciplined enemy units. So it, the desert really did give the kind of everything up to combat training that these units needed. Jim, you talked a little bit about in the, in our interview about the camaraderie that developed. I mean, a lot of times this was secondary training, right? After boot camp or whatever. And that camaraderie you had, and you, you took that into combat, right? Uh, yes, but you, we didn't establish, uh, Bomford and I didn't establish much 
camaraderie there with the other individuals because it was such a short period. But uh, they're right when they say that, that uh, the, our 104th Infantry Division was fighting another division or, or on maneuvers against another division. The other division uh, was defending the Palon Pass. And uh, I was told at the time that, and, and since that we were the first uh, division to ever take the, the 104th was the first division to take the Palin Pass. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, our commanding general was, and, and the one who took us overseas and brought us back, was General Terry Allen, who had been uh, yeah. relieved of his command of the first division uh, that fought in North Africa with Patton and then on, in Sicily. And he had been relieved of his command because of a disagreement and uh, came back to the States and was given the command of the 104th Infantry Division. And, and, uh, uh, and, and there were, yes, there were injuries to the division because uh, out of the ASTP program, there was some, uh, uh, in addition to the few of us that, that joined it at, at uh, Camp Granite. Uh, when we got to Camp Carson, there were some, they had shut the program down entirely, and there were some uh, 2,000 or 2,500 recruits that came into the 104th Infantry Division from the Army Specialized Training Program because the uh, 14 or 15,000 men that were uh, part of the 104th Infantry Division had been reduced by that many due to casualties in the field, one thing or another. Uh, and uh, Jim, you had you had you had served at the Battle of the Bulge, right? Correct. Not in the not actually in the Battle of the Bulge. Uh, we were on the northern apex, uh, at across from the, the city of Durham. Uh, on the Roar River, uh, we had were fighting from uh, Aachen to Cologne. Uh, had just gotten to the Roar River uh, when the bulge took place, and uh, we spent the entire from uh, December until they uh, push off in February. Uh, on the Roar River, right there, spread thin, but right there on the northern apex. But the main fighting of the bulge was to the south of us. Now, uh, there are, uh, I think we were, were part of the bulge because we were on the northern apex, but we weren't right there at the right. center of it. Right. Uh, but heavy, heavy action nevertheless. We got heavy action from, we, when the division went overseas, we initially were uh, assigned to the Canadian First Army uh, down in uh, uh, Belgium and Holland, uh, helping free the port of Antwerp. And that was after the uh, debacle of, the, uh, of a bridge too far. And uh, we, we lost a lot of casualties. We had a lot of casualties there. One, we were, that was the, the first actual combat that we experienced. And um, we were there about 30 days, and then we were transferred from the Canadian First Army to the first US Army at Aachen. And we relieved, uh, oddly enough, the first division at Aachen who had, uh, taken the town of Aachen, uh, which was kind of ironic because Terry Allen had been the commander, originally commander to take the 1st Division overseas, and the 104th Division is relieving the 1st Division at, mm. at Aachen, and then we were fighting. Uh, we fought, and, and there we, we got to Aachen uh, about the uh, first week of December, uh, right around Armistice Day. And uh, it took us from 
Armistice Day, uh, well, we didn't initially, uh, the, the combat didn't initially start. There was combat all the time, uh, but um, you weren't forging ahead, uh, and uh, you were just kind of maneuvering for positions. There were hills that you were trying to take to push off towards Cologne, and, and uh, we didn't get to the Roar River then from uh, the entire November, which was only a distance of maybe uh, 25 or 30 miles, actually. But it, it took uh, better than, than a month to get there. What do you remember most about the combat? What I remember most is is in Holland. Again, I was, uh, I was fortunate because I was assigned to a heavy weapons company, and a heavy weapons company uh, has uh, 30 caliber machine guns and uh, 81 millimeter mortars. And <clears throat> I was doubly fortunate because I was assigned to the mortar platoon, and the mortar platoon, the, the, when you go into combat, uh, the, the rifle companies are out there on the point. They're the ones. And um, then along with them are the machine gun platoons, usually. And uh, we had two machine gun platoons and one uh, 81 millimeter mortar platoon. The 81 millimeter mortar platoon is, is uh, uh, probably two or 300, normally two or 300 yards uh, behind the, the uh, where the, the battle is actually going on, maybe uh, 400 yards, but ne never much more than that. And uh, so uh, I wasn't uh, shot at very often. I was shot at uh, several times and by small arms fire, but uh, that was usually when we were moving up or something. But what I remember most is when we crossed the Mark River down in Holland, we crossed uh, in the middle of the night at about uh, 11 o'clock, and uh, the rifle platoons had already gone over. And then when we crossed over, uh, we crossed over a little too soon, I always felt, because we never... Uh, got much farther than, than maybe a, a hundred yards or so from the, the uh, river bank, 150 at most, and they opened up with an 81 millimeter uh, artillery piece, uh, or not an 81 millimeter, uh, 88. The Germans had an 88 millimeter artillery piece that was devastating. And... Uh, uh, they had us uh, pinned down there because we had had gone uh, over a little too early and we couldn't set up the mortars or anything and, and uh, we were like ducks on the pond. And the shells were coming in um, at a very rapid rate and, uh, uh, and people were being injured and, and there were, the, the cries, medic, and, and the mud and, and debris is falling down on you, and you're hugging the ground trying to crawl up into the, get all of your, you can into the, the iron and or steel helmet that you've got on, not that it's gonna protect you, but uh, that's the feeling that you have. That was the, the worst, and then from then on, uh, I think we learned to, how to do a better job fighting in one thing or another, and, and uh, I don't, oh, we got cut off in a, a town of Indian just before we got to the Roar River, uh, and we're cut off there for two or three days, and we weren't getting any rations in, and, and uh, you're living with uh, what was available to you in the field. We were. We had actually gotten into the town, but uh, uh, one of the 
rifle platoons, what happened, one of the rifle platoons had gotten lost. Again, we were moving ahead in the darkness and one of the rifle platoons had gotten lost. And instead of, of uh, uh, not rifle platoon, rifle company, and instead of being in the uh, right spot at the right time to back up C Company, who had gotten into the town, they were actually in another village that belonged in another uh, uh, regiment sector. And when the support didn't come, the Germans had a counterattack the, the C Company and uh, our forward observer, who was a, uh, at that time was a, a Lieutenant Canners. Um, he was with uh, C Company in the building and they all had to surrender along with the captain of C Company and, and a, uh, a, a Lieutenant of one of the rifle platoons in C Company. And we didn't see them then until the end of the war. Uh, when a, a German prisoner camp, but uh, um, the thing I remember about combat really was the baptismum of fire. Really, uh, a couple of days before the the Mark River crossing, when we got some machine gun fire and and uh, a little bit of, uh, 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 or oh, there were mines and some small arms fire, but. It was particularly the mines and the machine gun fire, and we lost our our uh, uh, sergeant of the mortar platoon because he he was uh, wounded in the heel by a bullet at that time. But, How many in your platoon, Kevin? Before, yeah. before we, we we follow up with that, you know, I I think it would be interesting to have, you know, Matt say one last thing before we go to questions about how these kinds of realist, these actual combat experiences were brought back to the Desert Training Center and they would, they would ad adapt their, their training in such a way to make it completely engrossing and encompassing. So they would pull back what all of their communications, all of their command and control, all of their logistical support and these guys these units would be out there on their own in these vast vast areas encountering you know s simulated enemy units as well as the train can you talk a little bit just a bit yeah definitely you know i think um, dr porch talked a little bit about that how the germans were so successful at combining all the different arms they were really good at using the infantry and the tanks and the air power, air power together and we weren't so good at that so that's one of the first sort of broad things they tried to emphasize in the Desert Training Center. But they also had, in the beginning of the American involvement in the war in North Africa, they had observers there, and they were bringing combat reports back and bringing them to the training in the desert and applying those to the more the smaller unit um, exercises. So it was really kind of being molded and evolving as the training was going on. You have to give the Army credit for that that they were trying to respond to the real conditions in the war. And um, so it's kind of like a laboratory. Yeah, I think so. And I, one of the things that they noticed was um, the key for the young lieutenants, you know, being able to take initiative on their own. And that's one of the things that they really focused right. on in the desert. They wanted them to have the confidence that they could take a unit out and survive and you know, achieve an objective and, you know, a lot of these guys were 19, 20 year olds and all of a sudden in charge of, you know, uh, a whole squad of guys for their lives. And so to give them that confidence that they knew that they could go out and achieve an objective in spite of all the hardships, which the desert certainly threw at them, that really gave them um, some of the tools that they needed once they got overseas. Imagine a lot of these soldiers, 19 or 20, I mean, we have a 22 year old who, you know, I mean, think about that. They were the ones that they fought, the fought war. this they war. The they war. fought this war. And they just did it. And, and I don't know how many 18 or 19 year olds you all know, but I'll, it's hard to imagine, to be honest. <laughs> right? So, do, yeah. Do we want to open it up to questions? Yeah, we were going to do questions, I think. Um, and do we have cards? Is that the idea, Brian? Right? Oh, okay. We can do a microphone for questions. 
Here's your hand, and I'll come on over your way. Annie. So what was what was the original seed of this project? I mean, what you know, at, at, at what point did someone say, we need to make this film, we need to tell this story in this way? W what was the seed? What generated this? We actually had done another film similar to this about the Desert Training Center, focusing more on, on pilots and, and uh, training pilots for the war. And the Bureau of Land Management had really wanted to tell this story as part of a bigger effort called Discover the Desert. And they worked out a deal with uh, one of the solar installation companies. And it was, in a sense, they kind of wrote it into a mitigation. They said, you know, we really want to do this documentary for PBS. If you help fund that, then we'll work with you on some of the construction stuff that they had to do. So it was, in the end, it was uh, your tax dollars that work here trying to you know, do federal mitigation and, and to, to get... To, to get this story told and, and to really support the efforts of, of their Discover the Desert campaign. I mean, there's a lot to see down in the desert, and, and I can tell you it, you know, it takes a while to see it, but when you explore, it's, a, it's pretty amazing, actually. There's actually, um, what, it, maybe 15 or 20 um, BLM archaeologists in, uh, in the western states, or at least in California in the west coast area. And, you know, because of budget restraints, they don't get an opportunity to do some right. really interesting and important work uh, in terms of uh, recording and interpreting um, history, whether it's like, you know, deep history with, you know, Native Americans occupying that area or the more recent stuff. So there's a lot of frustrated historians and archaeologists who know that we have a tremendous amount of uh, important information to convey to the, the the general public. And in fact, it's you know part of their mandate um, to administer those those lands on, on behalf of the public. So they looked for and found a creative way to fund um, a public information, public education campaign that feeds into that Discover the Desert effort. Um, and like I said, Matt had found, you know, historic footage. So, I mean, everybody knew that this is a really dynamite topic. I imagine, Susan, you probably enjoyed, you know, cutting this thing together because it is such a, it's a very compelling uh, angle by which to experience World War II, uh, to see it from that, that aspect. Um, our desert resource played a Im hugely important role. When you think one million uh, combat veterans passed through that landscape in just two years, and they fanned out once North Africa, it only took six months before North Africa was secured, you know, after the start of Desert Torch, they fanned out ac across the world. They fought in the Pacific, they right. fought in, in Europe, they fought in Italy, um, everywhere. So. You know, it's it's a really unique and important aspect to our own uh, American history and the local history if you're a Californian or at least Western States person. We could have done a series, but we did a half hour show. <laughs> yeah. So much more to say. Yeah, hi there. I've got two questions. Um, one, how soon did the troops know they were training for North Africa, if that was a secret or not? And the second one is, you know, when they did land in North Africa, they were actually fighting the French first. So I was curious to know whether that was at all confusing Fishy, to the yeah. troops. Yeah, because... Yeah, the ironic thing is most of the troops in the Desert Training Center did not end up in the desert. Right. So it's it's ironic, but it was still a, a good training ground for the other places that they did end up. You know, some of the first ones that ended up in the Aleutian Islands. So you can imagine <laughs> their surprise after having been <laughs> in the desert in the summer and they're up in the Aleutians. Um, but I don't, there was no surprise. I mean, everybody knew that we were going to go to North Africa. So... A lot of the troops that went to uh, some of the first units to the Desert Training Center knew that they were going to go to North Africa. And I think they were, a lot of them were excited, you know, to actually be the first troops to gain some combat. Next question, also coming from back here. What was the temperature inside a tank in the summer? Did they have air conditioners at that time? <laughs> No air conditioners. Uh, in the summer, I can't imagine how hot. I mean, there's 
footage of troops frying eggs on the exterior of some of the M4 tanks. So right. imagine what it was like inside. <laughs> We were scouting just, I would say, what was that, end of May or something like that? Yeah. And, and it was like 110 up to 117 degrees the day we were scouting. I mean, it's it's a little warm there, you know. And it's cold at night. Yeah. It's, it's high desert, right? It's, it's high desert, right. the wind. You heard the you veterans the talk about the wind. I don't know if you remember the wind, Jim, but that's oh, one yeah, of the things yeah. that I hear so much about from veterans and the sand getting into everything. Yes, you had. You had plenty of that. <laughs> <laughs> Sandy eggs. Sand and wind. Uh -huh. okay. Question coming from over here. Uh, yes, you didn't mention the fact that there is a visitor center and museum there, and uh, which gives uh, all sorts of details about that. They uh, do. The, the, the George Patton Memorial Museum, in fact, they have this uh, DVD, and, and they're, yeah. we worked with them extensively on the project. Also, a lot of the stills you saw up there. Also, were, you, uh, I think this could more properly be known as the Colorado Desert than the Mojave, but that may be a, you know, a it, detail. And another question, did the, uh, we had a big military and army training base here in Camp Roberts near Paso Robles, uh, a huge base, which California, Northern Californians are very familiar with. To what extent did those two bases interconnect or uh, cooperate, or did they were they t totally distinct? Yeah, they were actually distinct. Although some units would go from one to another, but the Desert Training Center was different in the sense that it was really a maneuver grounds. It wasn't a, a, a base like Camp Roberts was. So it was used to kind of put the finishing touches on a unit, particularly divisions. They would come from a place like Camp Roberts, go out to the, the Desert Training Center for several months to maneuver against other large divisions before they were sent overseas. You know, and I'll just add to that, that that training area is considered so valuable that we currently have two major installations right. still to this day out there. We have um, uh, 29 Palms, the Marine uh, base that's out there, plus, uh, or is Irwin. it Irwin? Fort or Irwin, Irwin yeah. which is a highly specialized, one of only three, I think, uh, uh, you know, very specialized training uh, sites in the United States that actually attracts uh, military from allies from around the world. We interviewed the commander of uh, Fort Irwin, and he said very similar stuff. You know, like nothing beats the desert for training. I mean, and they really have adopted that, and uh, it still informs. And they have full, you know, for overseas for Afghanistan and Iraq, they have really extensive mock um, villages, mock villages, and, and all towns. kinds of stuff and stuff. Yeah, yeah it's so. pretty wacky. Aisle. Um, can you tell us what you did to locate the veterans that you interviewed for the documentary? It, it was a big job, to be really honest. I mean, we, we interviewed 14 veterans, and we probably reached out to, I don't know, 50 or so. And a lot of things had to happen to do it. Um, you know, uh, people like Jim, who are, you know, have you know, very just incredibly cogent and thoughtful about their experience. And so we did our best to try to find folks like that. And, um, and as you can see, you know, in the, in the, in the show, a lot of them, are not, not everybody made the, the edit, but, but everybody we interviewed had great, great stories. And, and I just have to reiterate what an honor it is to interview them and to be able to upload their, you know, their interviews for everybody. I mean, there was, um, uh, the guy with the um, the Boston accent who, who loved the desert and loved the blooming of the desert, he sat down. He didn't get up for four hours. He sat there for four hours. All he did was talk, and he goes, you usually have to get up to go to the bathroom. I mean, it was, <laughs> it was like he was amazing. And it was, and it, you know, there was a sense of catharsis a little bit, I mean, with some of them. And with us, too, you yeah. know, to hear these, these stories, these Vets, who of course were first of all very generous to share their their stories with us, and it's really, really, as you can imagine, moving to listen to them talk. My dad served in World War II in the Navy. Um, I'm sure other people's uh, relatives uh, served in in the war, and you've heard some of these stories. And you know, these are perfect strangers. Whether it was Althea talking about you know her nursing career, she retires a full colonel in the uh, in the army. 
Um, you know, and to hear her talk about these guys who she realized, I mean, she served in the Korean War. She served right. in Vietnam. She knows when she says it does not serve our soldiers when they are so tight lipped and so taciturn and they keep, they retain their, their stories, you know, within them. And they, there isn't that catharsis. Um, so that when we hear it, we know that that's sort of part of this unburdening process that, that we were um, fortunate enough to, to be part of. But we had researchers helping us, and we put words out to, you know, the call out to veterans group groups, the VA, you know, local VA hospitals. We found, you know, I think, Kevin, you found the... The, the guy who managed the uh, tanker outfit uh, from where we got, you know, our, our Okies and Texans, you know, to talking about, you know, their the 740th tank uh, battalion, how to take out a tiger tank. Um, so we were just really fortunate that we were able to locate um, a lot of these guys. Tommy Thompson, the, 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 the guy who talked about, um, you know, dancing girls and it was dangerous and stuff. It, privately, he talked a little bit about this on camera, but he says, not a day goes by that he doesn't remember the Battle of the Bulge. He was deep in the Battle of the Bulge. And he, and, he, and he just, tears rolled up, and he just said, not a day goes by that he doesn't remember it. And he's like 93. And, you know, you just, it was pretty horrific to hear him talk about the Battle of the Bulge and to talk about his experiences there. It was, you know, it was winter and the frozen, the bodies were frozen and just, it was, it was really rough. And, and you know, we also have to remember, um, and I, and I say this with all due respect to my Russian dance teacher friend, Nikolai, that, you know, the war for the most part was won on the, the Eastern front. Um, we forget how much the, the Russians and the Eastern Europeans suffered you know, 20, 25 million dead, a lot of them civilians, maybe the bulk of them civilians. Uh, the U.S. suffered somewhere in the neighborhood of, you know, 400,000 or more, um, you know, deaths, military deaths. We were never bombed. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of perspective that we need to appreciate and understand as not just Americans, but as world citizens, you know, this was a world war. And um, yes, we made this program about our contribution to the war, but um, you know, if we had made this a 60 minute film, instead of a 30 minute film, there would have been more about um, the rest of the world and how it, uh, you know, stood up and, and did what it had to do as well to, uh, to you know, overcome fascism. Just one quick question. Um, is there still an issue down there? It seemed like they covered a lot of ground and, and, and you're wanting to have visitors and all. Is there still an issue with the unexploded ordinance? That's as a matter of fact, there is. <laughs> you guys have to be careful, if you ask no? the BLM archaeologists, they'll tell you, yeah, they're a little wary of people tromping, or tromping around in certain areas, you know, in those mock battlefield areas. There, there was live ammunition, and um, even a, a, an inert round still has a charge in a lot of cases. So there's thousands and thousands of anti-tank mines placed in the desert. So, and it's not been cleared. We found a lot of rounds out there, and we had to sign waivers. <laughs> I mean, they didn't tell us about that though until after we'd signed the contract. Right. <laughs> they did. They, they did use Italian POWs. An interesting right, story. Right. They had a couple of units of POWs that were um, stationed out on the Colorado River, and they had them do some EOD work, explosive ordnance disposal. So imagine these poor Italian young men stuck out there in the desert, clearing the desert of EOD. But they didn't get anywhere near the the extent of you know the areas that were uh, used. You can see on maps, it's marked right. um, where the um, unexploded ordinance is you know, allegedly to be. And it's a pretty extensive area, isn't it? They, they told us if you saw metal, not to strike it in really hard with any sharp objects. <laughs> <laughs> Anna Marie, is a filmmaker's wife a, um, a frustrating, uh, <laughs> scary proposition? <laughs> Other questions? We have room time for about maybe one or two more, I think. Uh, once again, thank you, gentlemen, for your hard work. Um, 
I'm curious in the psychological training that was involved, was there any exposure in your research to obviously the mechanics of what was needed had to be trained, but I think also psychologically these men had to be trained to know that we're going to win this because it looked pretty bleak going in. Was there any, yeah, any, well, any, certainly, any research or known, known Certainly, um, one of the things that struck me was, again, the battle reports from North Africa. A lot of the um, observers were noticing that the Americans did not have that sense of killer instinct. You know, one of the veterans talked about that. Americans weren't killer by nature, something like that. And that was one of the things that they really wanted to inure those um, soldiers. And Patton certainly you know, had that. And he wanted to give the troops the desire to close with the enemy and kill them. You know, he wanted to make them killers. So that was certainly part of the training, I think. I'll let you know, Jim talk about that in his training. But I think that was probably the most important part of their psychological training. Jim, what was your sense of that? Was there? Well, uh, what, what's the psychological? Well, the whole idea that you that here you were in the states and you you were going to go overseas and you were going to have to be killers. It was going to be kill or be killed. Or you and just you know kind of framing your mind around that. Personally, I I didn't give it much thought until I got over there. Yeah. And somebody was shooting at me. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Bullets have a way of doing that, I'm and, sure. Uh, for example, uh, after, uh, towards the uh, end of the bulge, uh, I, was, I had been made a squad leader just before uh, the bulge. And um, I have to gather my thoughts on it. The, the, uh, I'm sorry, it, it's drifted away from me. Uh, That's okay. You know, um, uh, you know, coming out of World War I, they, the term was shell shock. And I think that World War I ushered in this era of heightened technology. I mean, the war, the equipment was so much more devastating. Um, you know, goodbye cavalry, now you have tanks and you have mobile artillery and you have, you know, Stuka dive bombers. And I think the, the level of, of horror that the World War II soldier faced was just at a, a magnitude of order so much higher. And I don't think that our psychological response to that level of, 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 you know, dealing with so much carnage and, and just, you know, the explosive charges were so much more powerful that uh, it, it's taken us a long time to catch up with how to deal with the effects of, of exposure to battle. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, they were really trying to get them used to the sights and sounds of the battlefield. So you see training where they're crawling under barbed wire and they're firing machine guns over the top of them. They're exploding you know, rounds, um, uh, mortar rounds nearby them as close as possible without injuring them to get them used to that sound, which you know, few of us can really say what that's like unless we've been in that situation. It's hard to wrap your mind around. Well, in, in, in that, so the, the combat course, uh, yeah, and you did it at night, we, at least we did, and you've got live ammunition passing over your head and, and you, you uh, see the tracers and um, you're, they're setting off explosives all around you. But somehow, you know that they're not going to harm you. I mean, I don't know what it is. But when you're overseas and in a minefield, you're, you're, you're aware of it. Uh, what I was going to say, though, um, and it's, it's kill or be killed. And... Uh, 
I never uh, actually had to uh, point my personal arm uh, weapon at somebody and fire a shot because I, I didn't see them. But I had a sniper uh, a couple of times who was firing at me, and I knew he was firing at me, and I couldn't dig in. And I felt like, you know, that SOB, if I can ever get a shot at him, I'm going to take him out. Uh, and when there's something impersonal uh, about firing a mortar or even observing a mortar because uh, uh, you're away from it. And it's probably like bombing a city. Uh, you don't know that you realize the, the death and destruction. But another time uh, when we were on the Roar River, just prior to uh, pushing off from the Roar River after the bulge had been cleared off, uh, we had been taking German fire from artillery pieces the whole time we were there from uh, mid-December or so till, till uh, the 20th of February. And it got a little bit tiresome. And, and uh, <laughs> But on one occasion, uh, you, you could never see their guns. I mean, I, I was a forward observer during that period, and I would go up uh, a couple of days every week while we were there and, uh, and control some of the fire. And on this uh, one occasion, uh, it, we'd had a, uh, it had, the ground had been frozen and we had a light snow that covered it. And uh, we got a sudden uh, change in the weather uh, one, one day. And uh, the artillery piece, suddenly the camouflage was no longer camouflage because the, the little light covering and snow had, had melted and you, we saw the, the, the pieces out there. And uh, I got to direct the art, not the 81 millimeter mortars because it was beyond our range and there apparently wasn't a spotter plane that they could get up there and, or, and wanted to get firing on it. And I directed the artillery to that at the time. And they had just uh, come in with some uh, uh, shells that had radio in them so that they didn't explode on a time basis, but they got a signal from the ground back to the radio and, and you got a, an airburst that was an airburst. And uh, I fired, they, they bracketed in on the, the uh, piece. I, I was giving the instructions uh, to my lieutenant, and uh, he was forwarding it to the artillery pieces. And when we got it bracketed in, then they cut loose with a barrage of about uh, three pieces. And uh, the Germans didn't know what hit them. And there was a rush of, of adrenaline in you because, by golly, you saw it happening firsthand. Mm -hmm. uh, mm. And that's, uh, there's a, I mean, you were glad to knock them out. There's no question about it. Now that's part of the game. So, um, Jim, did you did you bring your poem? Mm -hmm. Did you bring your poem? Yes. yes. Uh, if I could, I'm sorry. What's that? I just want to know what it's going to be on paper. Okay. Yeah. So for so I will say that for public television, uh, we offered it up on the satellite, and it looks like right now 110 stations have taken it, and it looks like it's going to be like 190, maybe 200 broadcasts. Uh, a lot of them are going to be 
uh, in Memorial Day. So check KQED is going to be running it, KVIE, KOCE, all the all the West Coast stations are going to be having it. And um, and then um, it, actually we were thrilled. I mean, for a kind of a modest half hour film to get that kind of carriage is really really a, a big success. And and I think an honor, frankly, a response to the to the to the quality of the interviews with the veterans. I mean, the veterans are so compelling. So um, I want to say one thing. I, I think Jim has a poem here. Is that right? I, I do. I can recite it, I think. OK, I think he's going to recite a poem, which we found very lovely. I, I wrote this poem before I was drafted. I, I wrote this poem in either uh, December or January, December of 1942 or January of 1943 while I was still going to college. And it starts, it, I tabbed it to Soldier's poem, and it is, uh, he had heard the order to advance and now was on his way, marching across that desolate stretch in order to enter the fray. Don found him in the battle, fighting for what was right. Too well he knew man could not live in a nation ruled by might. He crawled into position, and there for a while he lay, till he saw a German moving 200 yards away. His gun was at his shoulder, the German in his sights. He squeezed the trigger tightly, and his face turned deathly white. The battle raged for many months, until the GIs won. Soon they'd be returning, for now their job was done. He thought of things that had happened that night as he knelt to pray, and he asked the God in heaven to hear what he had to say. Some mothers now are waiting for their sons whom I have shot. Am I to say it's nothing? that they had cast their lot? Is this what we are born for, to kill our fellow man, to destroy the things we dearly love and further what they began? Dear God, I ask you guide us in the peace that we shall write, that men may live the way they should and boys not have to fight. Thank you.